ओके स्टूडेंट्स सो इन लास्ट क्लास वी डिस्कस अबाउट कैलोरीमेट्री वी डिस्कस दैट इफ वी सप्लाई हीट टू एनी बॉडी देन टू पॉसिबिलिटीज आर देयर एक्सेप्ट थर्मल एक्सपेंशन इट्स टेम्परेचर कैन चेंज और इट्स फेज कैन चेंज तो बोथ वी अंडरस्टूड वेन फेज विल चेंज एंड वेन टेम्परेचर विल चेंज बोथ वी अंडरस्टूड If temperature changes, then you have to use this formula delta Q equal to m s delta T. And if phase changes, then how much heat we supplied Q equal to m L, right? Okay. So both we understood in last class. Today we will discuss ideal gas laws. Okay. So first, which gas is ideal gas? Okay. All gases are not ideal. For ideal gas, some conditions are there. If a gas follow those conditions, then that i that gas becomes ideal gas. Okay. So these are the laws. A gas must follow these laws, then that gas becomes ideal gas. Okay. So first law is Boyle's law. Okay. to understand this boyle's law and this is important for neat exam also okay to so boyle's law first statement statement is written you all can read this statement according to it for a given mass of an ideal gas at constant temperature what is the condition constant temperature what is the key point here constant temperature so this is key point right so wherever such type of points are there so these key point you have to underline right constant temperature okay so according to it for a given mass of an ideal gas at constant temperature the volume of gas is inversely proportional to pressure you know very well what you all use balloon right in balloon you filled air also okay so a balloon you have now what you are doing you are compressing the balloon tell me can you compress the balloon you will say yes and when you compress the balloon so its size decreases agree or not yes if size decreases means volume decreases agree or not so its volume decreases okay and if volume decreases to what about pressure to at the same time how this volume is decreasing to you are compressing it means you are applying external force agree or not so you are applying external force and pressure formula you all know pressure equal to force divided by area means force produce pressure yes so we apply extra force means we apply extra pressure on the balloon if we apply extra pressure to what will happen in front of us we can see that balloon size decreases means balloon volume decreases right to so pressure we are increasing to volume decreases agree or not okay so we can say that pressure and volume both are inversely proportional but it happen only if temperature is constant so condition is what temperature must be constant then volume and pressure both are inversely proportional means if pressure increases here we can understand we can write it like this also pressure is inversely proportional to volume so if volume increases then pressure will decrease right and reverse reverse that if volume decreases then pressure increases actually here one point one point that first we have to increase the pressure then only volume will decrease right or not 
तो वी हैव टू इंक्रीज द प्रेशर देन वॉल्यूम डिक्रीजेज आई गिवन द एग्जाम्पल बेलून एग्जाम्पल ओके सो इफ वी ड्रो ग्राफ बिटवीन प्रेशर एंड वॉल्यूम तो दिस ग्राफ इज लाइक दिस हाउ यस वी कैन से दैट इफ वी मूव दिस साइड तो वॉल्यूम विल इंक्रीज इफ वी मूव दिस साइड तो वॉल्यूम विल इंक्रीज इफ वॉल्यूम विल इंक्रीज तो प्रेशर मस्ट डिक्रीज तो यू कैन सी दिस ग्राफ इज मूविंग डाउन एंड ऑन द वाई एक्सिस वॉट इज देयर वॉल्यूम अदरवाइज यू कैन चेक यू कैन टेक एनी वॉल्यूम सपोज दिस वॉल्यूम दिस वॉल्यूम इज वी वन हाउ मच प्रेशर हियर प्रेशर इज ऑन वाई एक्सिस तो प्रेशर इज पी वन ओके नाउ टेक वन मोर वॉल्यूम दिस वॉल्यूम इज वी टू हाउ मच प्रेशर प्रेशर इज पी टू नाउ टेल मी विच वॉल्यूम इज हायर वी टू इज हायर ओके विच प्रेशर इज हायर विच प्रेशर इज लेस इफ वॉल्यूम वी टू इज हायर देन क्रॉसपोर्डिंग टू वॉल्यूम वी टू प्रेशर पी टू पी टू इज लेस देन पी वन तो वी कैन सी हियर दैट वी टू इज ग्रेटर देन वी वन वी टू इज ग्रेटर देन क्रॉसपोर्डिंग टू इट प्रेशर इज लेस तो दिस पी टू इज लेस देन पी वन मीन्स बोथ आर इनवर्सली प्रपोर्सनल अंडरस्टूड इज इट क्लियर टू ऑल ऑफ यू ओके तो वी अंडरस्टूड इट नाउ वन मोर ग्राफ इज देयर इन नीट दे आस्क डिफरेंट डिफरेंट ग्राफ प्रेशर वॉल्यूम ग्राफ वी अंडरस्टूड समटाइम दे आस्क ग्राफ बिटवीन पी वी एंड वी ग्राफ बिटवीन पी वी एंड वी तो हाउ टू नो अंडरस्टैंड तो वट इज द कंडीशन कंडीशन इज दैट अंडरस्टैंड दिस पॉइंट कंडीशन इज वॉट दैट वॉल्यूम इज इनवर्सली प्रपोर्सनल टू प्रेशर ओके सो यस्टरडे ऑल्सो वी डिस्कस दैट इफ वी रिमूव प्रपोर्सनलिटी कॉन्स्टेंट If we remove proportional signs, then we have to remove it by using a constant. Agree or not? So here also, if we remove this proportional sign, then it must be v equal to constant by p. What is c here? C is proportionality constant. Agree or not? Okay. Now. If we draw graph between volume and pressure, so we understood this graph is like this. But here, this graph is given between P V and V. Okay. So how to draw graph? Understand this point. This is very very important. Understand everyone. Understand everyone how to draw graph. Okay. So first you have to check on y-axis what is given. On y-axis what is given? This is y-axis. You know, this is this is y-axis. Okay, and this is x-axis. Yes, you all know it. So on y-axis what is given? P-V, and on x-axis what is given? V. Okay. So what you have to do here? Transfer P this side. then it will become pv okay to so pv equal to constant if we transfer this side to pv equal to constant means product of pressure and volume is not changing you agree or not pv equal to constant means product of p and v pressure and volume is not changing whatever you do whatever you do it will remain constant at constant Temperature, agree or not? And for a given mass of an ideal gas, this one also you have to remember that mass of ideal gas must be constant. Both are the condition. Is it clear or not? Okay. So P V is constant. Whether you increase pressure or you decrease volume, you increase volume. or you decrease pressure whatever you do pv will not change that's why graph between pv and volume 
is a straight line why straight line because pv is not changing pv equal to constant you agree or not here we can see this pv on y axis what is there pv so this is y okay this is y y equal to constant c is constant agree or not so you can see here this y value is constant here okay this y value is constant this is constant here also here we drawn graph between pv and v here we drawn graph between pv and p both are constant pv is not changing by changing pressure pv is not changing by changing volume why because pv is constant so this is constant here also we can see this is what constant clear okay this is y axis and this is x axis understood you all so we understood here graph between pressure and volume first then pv and volume then pv and v now one question for you one question for you can you draw graph between pressure and 1 by v okay what i am asking graph between pressure and 1 by v okay you can see here what i am asking graph between pressure and 1 by v not v here v is there now i am asking pressure and 1 by v can you draw graph you can you can send your response that this graph sir it will be uh, it will be hyperbola parabola like this very good one girl this ratna yesterday also this girl given response i remember uh, this girl's given correct answer very good ratna and uh, this okay uh, ratna yes very good correct and this skoti vara koteswara uh, your answer also venkateswar correct very good and uh, this madhu also correct very good you all are good students eh? i am very happy that you are given correct response very good all are now all are saying straight path straight line very good very good okay so how to draw graph very simple you have to just check on y axis what is there on x axis what is there means here y axis pressure is there so this pressure becomes equal to y this pressure becomes equal to y okay because this pressure is on y axis 1 by v is on x axis to so 1 by v becomes x agree or not okay now what is the condition condition is we know the condition condition is v equal to c by p this is what boils law okay we know the condition now now here put the values so 1 by v is x to do one thing transfer p this side so it is do one thing here transfer this p this side v this side so it become p equal to c by v okay now p is y and 1 by v is x 1 by v you know, we can write it 1 by v into c to so 1 by v is x and c also 
ओके अदरवाइज वाई इक्वल टू सी एक्स तो दिस इज वॉट दिस इज स्ट्रेट लाइन है ना वाई एंड एक्स बोथ आर डायरेक्टली प्रोपोर्शनल तो दिस ग्राफ इज स्ट्रेट लाइन यू एग्री और नॉट तो ग्राफ विल बी स्ट्रेट लाइन राइट ओके सो वी अंडरस्टूड ग्राफ बिटवीन प्रेशर एंड वन बाई वी विल बी स्ट्रेट लाइन ओके तो वी अंडरस्टूड बोइल्स लो वॉट आर द कंडीशन इफ मास ऑफ आइडियल गैस इज कॉन्स्टेंट एंड टेम्परेचर इज कॉन्स्टेंट देन वी कैन से दैट प्रेशर एंड वॉल्यूम बोथ आर इनवर्सली प्रोपोर्शनल एंड वी नो वेरी वेल इट इफ वी कंप्रेस द बेलून देन बेलून साइज डिक्रीजेस मीन्स बेलून वॉल्यूम डिक्रीजेस एंड वी आर कंप्रेसिंग इट मीन्स वी आर अप्लाइंग एक्स्ट्रा फोर्स means we are producing extra pressure because force produce pressure pressure equal to force by area okay so we understood it now next is charles law what is the condition what you have to mark here what is key point here so key point is read the line according to it for a given mass of an ideal gas at constant pressure so this time pressure is constant volume of gas is directly proportional to absolute temperature so this time what they given that if constant pressure is there and given mass also fix right we are doing experiment here for a particular amount of ideal gas okay and if we maintain constant pressure then we can say volume and temperature both are directly proportional right if we heat up the balloon then what will happen say you all seen hot hot balloon hot gas ba balloon you all seen right so if we heat up the balloon then what happen you will say sir that balloon expand right or not so if heat up heat up means increase in temperature right so if there is a increase in temperature then if it will expand expand means we can say that its volume will increase so at constant pressure and we are doing all these things in surrounding in atmosphere so in atmosphere whatever is pressure is there that pressure is same constant it is the pressure is not changing so we can say that directly proportional to temperature volume is directly proportional to temperature if we increase the temperature then volume increases so here graph easily we can understand that graph will be straight line right between volume and temperature between pressure and volume it is inversely proportional but here straight line okay to so graph between volume and temperature is a straight line understood now here v by t and v and here v by t in t so how to remember it understand so we know what v is proportional to temperature so again here also same what we have to do remove the proportional sign how by using constant so we can write it v equal to ct what is c here c is constant agree or not okay if we draw graph between volume and temperature then both are directly proportional if proportional then graph will be straight line okay if we draw graph between v by t and v then it will be to understand divide this t this side so it become v by t equal to c and what is c c is constant so again same thing that we discuss here that pv is constant here v by t is constant means whatever we do we change temperature or volume but their ratio v by t will not change it will remain constant so v by t is constant this is what v by t and it is constant it is not changing agree or not here also this v by t is constant it is not changing is it clear to so whether we change the volume 
or temperature but v by t will not change why because it is the ratio if we double the temperature then volume also doubled then ratio will remain constant if we half the temperature then v by then volume also become half if volume become half means if volume become half means again ratio will remain constant is it clear to all of you okay to so we understood this charles law also now next next is gelusek law what is it read this statement according to it for a given mass of an ideal gas at constant volume what is the condition constant volume you can see first constant temperature then constant pressure then constant volume you know for ideal gas for any gas we define three quantities these are required necessary to understand the gas behavior what these are pressure volume temperature okay to so first constant temperature in boyle's law then in charles law constant pressure then in gelusek law constant volume and in all three laws given amount of ideal gas means whatever is the amount mass of ideal gas that is constant throughout the experiment it is not changing so again condition we know given mass okay and constant volume so here we maintain the temperature constant then remaining quantity pressure volume constant pressure pressure then remaining quantity volume and temperature constant volume then remaining quantity pressure and temperature so if volume is constant then we can say pressure is directly proportional to absolute temperature p proportional to t now this charles law graph and gelusek law graph only one change what t as it is at the place of volume pressure is there at the place of volume pressure is there at the place of v by t it will be p by t v by t it will be p by t other are as it is to graph also as it is similar graph agree or not okay so here this is y axis and at y axis what we are taking pressure pressure and temperature both are directly proportional to graph will be straight line again they are taking here p by t so same thing we have to do again p is proportional to t we have to remove this proportional sign then p equal to c t okay what is c constant what is c here c is constant okay so p and t directly proportional so graph is straight line now next p by t so we need p by t to do one thing divide t this side so p by t is equal to c and c is what constant means again ratio of pressure and temperature remain constant whatever you do always it is constant if we maintain constant volume and given mass agree or not so if we change pressure then also p by t will not change if we change temperature then also p by t will not change but if we change volume then it will change because p by t is constant if volume is constant if volume is not constant then this condition is not possible is it clear understood to so you all understood it okay just you can see these all three laws because these are very important and further we will solve questions okay completing one more law we have to complete then we will solve questions okay next next is dalton's law to understand it dalton's law partial pressure so what is it according to it 
द प्रेशर एक्सर्टेड बाई द मिक्सचर ऑफ नॉन रिएक्टिव गैसेज इज इक्वल टू द सम ऑफ पार्शियल प्रेशर ऑफ ईच कंपोनेंट गैसेज प्रजेंट इन द मिक्सर सपोज ए मिक्सर इज देयर इन दैट टू थ्री गैसेज आर देयर If we talk about suppose in this room, this room is closed, okay, and in this room we filled two gases. One is oxygen and another is nitrogen, okay. So oxygen gas will apply pressure here. Yes, each gas apply pressure, okay. Nitrogen gas also apply pressure. Yes. Then total pressure will be pressure due to nitrogen gas plus pressure due to oxygen gas so this is dalton's law it is not a rocket science very simple it is what that uh, in the mixture total pressure total pressure is equal to the sum of partial pressure of each component of gas partial pressure means pressure due to individual gas pressure due to nitrogen plus pressure due to oxygen equal to total pressure agree or not one example this as an example you can understand suppose in this in this container two gases are there o2 and n2 okay so total pressure total pressure is equal to pressure due to oxygen gas plus pressure due to nitrogen gas this is known as partial pressure also partial pressure means pressure due to any one gas that is the meaning of partial pressure okay partial pressure means pressure due to individual gas clear okay to be understood dalton's law also now we will solve question to you all understood these all laws i believe and uh, now we will solve questions so let's see how many of you will give correct response okay shall we start question solving okay students answer also given but be a genuine student honest student okay first question what is given the pressure of a given mass of a gas what first how to solve questions to understand this point given mass this is the key point so you have to underline given mass because in all all these laws we discuss given mass okay of a gas filled in a vessel of volume v it is filled in a vessel of volume v okay at constant temperature okay temperature is constant so initial volume v and temperature constant if temperature is constant then what will come in your mind which law will strike in your mind boils law or not agree or not so just by reading it in our mind what will strike that it is related to boyle's law agree or not if it is related to boyle's law then then we have to use boyle's law condition and what is that pressure and volume both are inversely proportional right or not otherwise p equal to c by v this is going in our mind hai na we are not doing anything this is just we are thinking after reading this point right or not okay 
is reduced to one by third of initial volume. So what is given? Initial volume that is how much V. Then final volume that is how much V by three. Agree or not? These are given quantities. Calculate the percentage change in volume. No. Pressure is reduced to one by third. They given that pressure is reduced to one by third. Okay. So actually here pressure is reduced to one by third. So V final V final we don't know. Okay. We know suppose P initial is P, then P final is given P by three. So V final we can calculate by using it. Agree or not? Because P V multiple is constant. If it is constant, then we can say what P V product of pressure and volume is constant means initial equal to final. Constant means quantity is not changing. Quantity is not changing means whatever it was earlier that is now. Okay, means P initial V initial is equal to P final V final. Right or not? this condition so here pressure is given okay p final is given p by 3 to put the value to p initial p v initial v p final p by 3 and v final we don't know to p p cancel out 3 transfer this side to v final value is how much 3 v agree or not to volume becomes 3 times is it clear? Okay. Now students, this is the percentage change. You will see in physics, in many chapters, in many chapters at multiple places, you will see this type of question, find percentage change, find percentage change. Okay. So how to find percentage change understand? Percentage change formula is, this formula you have to remember percentage change formula is final quantity minus initial quantity divided by initial quantity this is percentage change and percentage change we are solving so multiply with 100 okay so final volume minus initial volume by initial volume into 100 this is the formula of percentage change is it clear okay so here we need final volume already we calculated that is 3v okay initial volume that is v initial volume v multiplied by 100 so you know 3v minus v 2v okay so it become it become it become 2v by v into 100 v v cancel out to so answer is 200 percentage is it clear this is answer Understood everyone? Okay, now this question. This question we will solve later because we till now we did not discuss ideal gas equation. Okay, so we will solve this question later. Okay, it is clear. Now next. This question is little bit tough. Okay. So I will share these questions as a homework in our telegram group. So you have to try this question and this last question also. Because here they are using ideal gas equation. So first we have to know that ideal gas equation how to form. 
to understand this point ideal gas equation very important we discuss three laws by using those laws because those are for ideal gas by using those only we will form ideal gas equation okay what is it understand and here also this point you have to remember that pressure is proportional to number of moles pressure is proportional to number of moles okay so we discussed there that pressure is inversely proportional to volume where boils law okay equation number 1 then we discuss pressure is directly proportional to temperature which law we discuss it you know pressure is directly proportional to temperature gallo sec law right okay equation number 2 okay and pressure of any gas is directly proportional to number of moles pressure of any gas is directly proportional to number of moles here n is number of moles if we combine these three then it become pressure is proportional to t n pressure is proportional to n and t inversely proportional to volume if we remove the proportional sign then here also we need a constant that constant is r here we will take c also but we given this constant name r so it is p equal to n r t by v otherwise we can transfer v this side then it become p v equal to n r t this is the ideal gas equation this is the ideal gas equation this one you have to remember what is r here r is constant and this r values also fix because it is constant so these values you have to remember is it clear so this equation is ideal gas equation pv equal to nrt this n is number of mole here r gas constant and p pressure we already discuss v volume and t temperature by using all these law finally we form this equation is it clear so in these two question question number example number 2 and in this example this ideal gas equation we have to use so you have to try these questions at your home because today time completed okay friends so i hope you all enjoyed the class and you understood today gas laws and ideal gas equation okay thank you so much for listening the class further we'll discuss in next class so in last class what we have discussed electronic concept of oxidation reduction and basics of oxidation number how to calculate oxidation number now let us start today's class so we'll start about rules for calculation of oxidation number we have written two rules so we'll write in brief those two rules then move to third so what we are discussing rules for calculation of oxidation number okay 
सो इन लास्ट क्लास वी हैव डिस्कस टू रूट्स फर्स्ट वी हैव रिटर्न इफ एनी एलिमेंट इन इट्स फ्री स्टेट और एलिमेंटल स्टेट देन व्हाट इज ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर असाइन टू देम ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर इज इक्वल टू जीरो एंड सेकेंड रूल वी हैव रिटर्न दैट ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर ऑफ any cation or anion is equal to charge present on it you know this is not valid for polyatomic ions not for polyatomic ions so if you remember in last class we have written these two rules first rule we have written for free state or elemental state that oxidation number is zero and next rule we have written oxidation number of any simple cation or anion is equal to charge present on it so if you write uh, examples for example f negative what is oxidation number minus 1 this is simple anion sulfur 2 negative what is oxidation number minus 2 if i write magnesium plus 2 what is oxidation number plus 2 so these are simple anions and oxidation number is equal to charge present on it now let us move to third rule so these two we have discussed in last class now third rule is if we take alkali metals <coughs> in periodic table if we take lithium sodium potassium these elements are called as alkali metals so i am writing here which elements lithium sodium potassium rubidium cesium in its combined state remember what we are writing combined state not elemental state shows which oxidation number plus one oxidation number clear so whenever they are forming compounds alkali metal they shows what oxidation number plus one oxidation number let us take some examples first example i am writing compound for sodium let us take sodium chloride now in sodium chloride what is oxidation number of sodium plus one then oxidation number of chlorine will be minus one so alkali metal in its combined state is showing what oxidation number plus one let us take any other example if i take a2co3 what is name of this compound name of this compound is potassium carbonate now if i break this compound into ions how to break this what is present here k positive and which ion is present here carbonate ion we have no idea about any carbonate carbon oxygen leave that what we need only potassium so here what is oxidation number of potassium it is plus 1 so whenever alkali metal forms compound means it is in combined state they show what oxidation number always plus 1 clear now if we move to next rule next is for alkaline earth metals alkaline earth metals now group 2 elements are called as alkaline earth metal here we write beryllium also but actually beryllium is not considered as alkaline earth metal but in we are writing for group 2 elements we consider here beryllium also so beryllium magnesium calcium strontium barium these two are group 2 elements so whenever these alkaline earth metal will form compounds they form which oxidation state plus 2 oxidation state in its combined state shows plus 2 oxidation state so let us take example for these compounds let us take compounds very simple magnesium chloride mgcl2 so if i break this magnesium chloride into cation and anion this is ionic compound magnesium plus 2 and what is present here cl negative 
सो वट वी कैन से आर ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर ऑफ मैग्नीशियम इन एम जी सी एल टू इज वट इज ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर प्लस टू बिकॉज इट इज अल्कलाइन अर्थ मेटल सो इट शोज विच ऑक्सीडेशन स्टेट प्लस टू लेट एस टेक वन मोर एग्जाम्पल सी एस ओ फोर सो वट इज नेम ऑफ कंपाउंड कैल्शियम सल्फेट नाउ इफ वी ब्रेक दिस so what is present here calcium plus 2 and so4 two negative so oxidation number of calcium in this compound is what is oxidation number plus 2 okay. so alkali metal has one electron in outer most shell so they lose one electron and what is form cation having plus one charge alkaline earth metal have how many electrons in outer most shell two electron so they will lose two electron and what charge is present plus 2 is present in its combined state So these two points we have to remember for alkali metal oxidation state is plus one for alkaline earth metal oxidation state is plus two. Now next move to hydrogen. So generally hydrogen shows. Plus one oxidation state in its compound, except which one? Except ionic hydrides. Now, what is meaning of ionic hydride? Now, this is important. So, meaning of ionic hydride is whenever hydrogen combine with any S block element. S block element means alkali metal and alkaline earth metal. So whenever any S block element combines with hydrogen, that is called as which hydride? Ionic hydride. And in ionic hydride, what is oxidation number of hydrogen in these compounds? It is minus one. Generally, it will show plus one. But in case of ionic hydride, that is S block element plus hydrogen compound. What is oxidation number of hydrogen? It is minus one. So if I take example, first example, let us take HCl. Now HCl we all know it is H positive and Cl negative. So what is oxidation number of hydrogen here? Oxidation number is plus one. So hydrogen is plus one, chlorine is minus one. now this is simple now in case of ionic hydride let us take example of any ionic hydride nah now sodium is which metal alkali metal and it is s block element s block element plus hydrogen it is ionic hydride so in case of ionic hydride when you break alkali metal always shows plus 1 then hydrogen has to show what oxidation number minus 1 so in this compound what is oxidation number of hydrogen it is minus 1 clear so this we have to remember that in case of hydrogen generally it shows plus 1 generally it shows which oxidation number plus 1 but in case of ionic hydride s block element plus hydrogen oxidation number of hydrogen is how much minus 1 now let us move to next point sixth point that is for halogens so generally halogens which are halogens fluorine chlorine bromine iodine in its compounds shows minus 1 oxidation state so what is general oxidation state what is neutral compound we'll discuss neutral compound wait for some time now whenever its compound is formed why that exception for hydrogen it is not exception alkali metals and alkaline earth metals are electro positive than hydrogen so electro positive will show positive oxidation state and electro negative hydrogen is more electro negative than that so alkali shows positive hydrogen will show then negative remember this thing more electro negative element will get negative charge and electro positive will get positive charge okay 
Now, generally, halogen shows which oxidation state minus one. Now, in complete periodic table, most electronegative element is fluorine. So, what we write? Fluorine in its compounds. always shows minus 1 oxidation state. Fluorine cannot show any other, only what we have to write, minus 1. But in case of chlorine, bromine and iodine, they can show range minus 1, 2, plus 7. So, they can show range. If it is more electronegative than minus 1, if they are less electronegative, then they can show positive oxidation state also. Here, what is neutral compound? And compound does not have any charge, that is called as neutral compound. What is difficulty in this? CO2. Sir, then acetine. That is radioactive element. You cannot, you do not find any compounds of acetine. You will find compounds of only these, fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine. So, for radioactive elements, we are not discussing here. So, chlorine, bromine, iodine can show a range of oxidation state that is minus 1, 2, plus 7. So, if we take examples, let us take NaF, sodium fluoride. So, what is oxidation state of sodium air? Plus 1. Oxidation state of fluorine is minus 1. Similar example, if we take KCl, so potassium will show plus 1, chlorine will show minus 1. So, this is general. But if we take more electronegative element, this is very good, ClF3. Now, you have to tell what is oxidation number of chlorine and what is oxidation number of chlorine in this compound, ClF3. In ClF3, you have to tell oxidation number of chlorine and fluorine. Uh, Ratna chlorine plus 3, very good. Because remember here, fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine. So, more electronegative will show which charge? Minus 1. Now, 3 fluorine are present. So, total charge minus 3. So, here chlorine is present in which oxidation state? Plus 3. And fluorine is present in minus 1. Remember, there are 3 fluorine. So, 1 fluorine minus 1, total 3 fluorine minus 1. So, chlorine is present in plus 3. So, we can say here that chlorine, bromine, iodine can show range of oxidation state minus 1 to plus 7. And this fluorine always shows which oxidation state minus 1 because fluorine is most electronegative element in the periodic table. Okay. Now, if we move to next element that is oxygen. So, what we write generally? Oxygen shows minus 2 oxidation number in its compounds. Okay. So, generally oxygen shows which oxidation number minus 2 and oxygen minus 2 is called as oxide. But there are some other compounds of oxygen which are formed that is peroxide, superoxide, and when oxygen combines with fluorine. So, different oxidation number are possible. Remember for O2, one simple theory is used that is molecular orbital theory that we will study in chemical bonding. So, O2 will combine used as a molecule. We do not write oxygen oxygen atom, but we write O2 molecule for peroxide and superoxide. So, if I write oxygen 2 negative, this is called as which ion? Oxide ion. And what is oxidation number here? Minus 2. Okay. And next, if we write O2, 2 negative. Now, remember O2 is a complete molecule having with charge minus 2. We do not write that oxygen, oxygen because O2 is a homonuclear diatomic molecule for this bonding. What is used? Molecular orbital theory. That we will study in later part of chemistry, chemical bonding. So, name of this ion is peroxide ion. So, in peroxide ion, oxidation number is minus 1. It is oxidation number, 2 oxygen having minus 2. So, for 1 oxygen, what is charge? Minus 1. 
एंड नेक्स्ट इज सुपर ऑक्साइड ओ टू माइनस वन सो वेन ओ टू गेन्स वन इलेक्ट्रॉन विच आइन इज फॉर्म सुपर ऑक्साइड एंड वट इज ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर माइनस वन बाय टू आई एम नॉट राइटिंग ऑक्सीडेशन सेट एर आई एम राइटिंग ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर सो ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर ऑफ ऑक्सीजन इन ओ टू नेगेटिव इज हाउ मच माइनस वन बाय टू सो रिमेंबर ओ टू टू नेगेटिव इज पर ऑक्साइड ओ टू नेगेटिव इज कॉल्ड एज सुपर ऑक्साइड सो इफ आई राइट एग्जाम्पल्स फॉर दीज लेट एस टेक कंपाउंड एन ए टू ओ टू and one compound is ko2 you have to tell name of these two compounds what is name of na2o2 and what is name of ko2 tell me name of these two compounds then we discuss about their oxidation number <clears throat> only names you have to tell not any oxidation number name of na2o2 and name of ko2 na2o2 is sodium peroxide very good what is name of ko2 ko2 is potassium superoxide very good now how to identify it is peroxide or superoxide it is very easy Break these into ions. Now, how many sodium are present? Two. And what is charge on sodium? Plus one. So total charge is plus two. So this O two will get what charge? Total minus two. And what is O two minus two? It is which ion? Peroxide ion. So what is name for this compound? Can we say this is sodium peroxide? and in peroxide what is oxidation number of oxygen minus 1 same if we break this ko2 how to break this ko2 potassium shows plus 1 only one potassium so what will be charge on two oxygen it will be minus 1 because total charge will be same positive and negative because it is a neutral so k positive o2 negative now in o2 negative what is name for o2 negative superoxide so oxidation number is minus 1 by 2 and what is name of compound it is potassium superoxide clear so remember this this peroxide and superoxide either you will find in acids of sulfur oxo acid and somewhere you find in this s block elements so potassium superoxide sodium peroxide and next important point is whenever oxygen combines with fluorine now fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen so fluorine shows which oxidation number minus 1 then oxygen has to show which oxidation state positive So if I write oxidation state in OF two, two fluorine minus two, so oxygen will show plus two. Now here two fluorine minus two, not two oxygen, so one oxygen will show plus one. Now in OF two, what is oxidation number of oxygen plus two? In O two F two, what is oxidation number of oxygen plus one? So only there are two compounds of oxygen OF two and O two F two where oxygen can show plus one oxidation state and plus two oxidation state. reason is fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen so fluorine will show negative oxygen will show positive there is one more ion ozonide ion o3 negative but that is not required ozonide what is oxidation number minus 1 by 3 if you want to write i will write here o3 negative this is called as which ion ozonide ion but you will find very less this ion o3 negative So if I write oxidation number of oxygen here, it is minus one by three. For three oxygen, minus one. For one oxygen, it is minus one by three. But this ozonide ion you will find very less. More important, what you find is oxide, peroxide, superoxide, and these two compounds of with fluorine, O F two and O two F two. Clear? So this is for which element? Oxygen. So general oxidation state is how much? Minus two. 
which is least electronegative. Alkali metals on moving down the group. So, if we do not consider uh, electro uh, radioactive element, then cesium is least electronegative. Metals are electropositive. Non-metals are electronegative. Just remember this term. And only remember three elements. Fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen. Fluorine is most, then oxygen, then nitrogen. So, when this periodic table you will study, then you will find all these order. Order for electronegativity, order for electropositivity. Now, let us move to next point. So, we have written all the elements whose oxidation number is fixed. Now, if we take any neutral molecule, let us take NaCl. Now, NaCl, there is no charge present on this compound. So, how many elements are present here? Two elements. One is sodium and one is chlorine. So, if we take oxidation number of sodium, how much it is? Plus 1. And oxidation number of chlorine is minus 1. So, what is sum of these oxidation number? It is equal to 0. So, whenever there is a neutral molecule or neutral compound, means compound does not have any charge, then sum of oxidation number of all atoms in that molecule is equal to 0. Now, this rule will be helpful in finding the oxidation number of any one atom whose oxidation number is variable. For example, if three elements are present in a compound, for two oxidation number is fixed, that we know, and for one element it is unknown, then sum of oxidation number is equal to 0. So, what rule we write here? That sum of oxidation number of all atoms in a neutral molecule is equal to 0. Yeah. So, first I am writing very simple example NaCl. So, if I write oxidation number of sodium here plus 1 and what is oxidation number of chlorine here minus 1. So, if I write sum of oxidation number, it comes out to be 0. Oxidation number of sodium plus oxidation number of chlorine, it is equal to 0. Now, where this rule is applied? Now, this rule will be applied for calculation of oxidation number of any one atom in a neutral molecule and out of these three for hydrogen oxidation number we know for oxygen we know what is unknown here sulfur so we have to find this oxidation number of sulfur now how to write this how many hydrogen are present two and what is oxidation number of hydrogen plus one now next is one sulfur is present for sulfur we do not know let us take x now after this how many oxygen are present four and oxygen shows generally with oxidation state minus 2. Now, sum of oxidation number is equal to 0. Listen again, what we have to take, how many hydrogen are there? 2. So, 2 into for 1 hydrogen charge is plus 1. Next, sulfur is unknown. So, what we are taking here? X. Now, plus 4 oxygen and oxidation number of oxygen is generally minus 2. So, 4 into minus 2 is equal to 0. So, when you solve this, what do you get? 2 plus X minus 8 is equal to 0. So, what is value of x plus 6? So, can we say oxidation number of sulfur in this compound is plus 6? Just like any doubt in this example H2SO4, we have used this formula sum of oxidation number of all atoms in a neutral molecule is equal to 0. Only this you have to check in H2SO4, any doubt? So, if there is no doubt, I will write one example. HNO3. You have to find out what is oxidation number of nitrogen in HNO3. Oxidation state we will discuss in next class. Today we are discussing oxidation number. So, focus on oxidation number. Tell me what is oxidation number of nitrogen in HNO3. Uh, students are telling plus 5. Very good. You know, whenever you are writing oxidation number, do not say only 5. You have to tell plus 5 or minus 5. So, answer is plus 5. So, how many hydrogen? 1. For hydrogen, plus 1. 
फॉर नाइट्रोजन वट वी टेक एक्स थ्री इन टू माइनस टू इज इक्वल टू जीरो सो वट इज ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर इफ यू फाइंड वट वी गेट प्लस फाइव सो ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर ऑफ नाइट्रोजन इन दिस कंपाउंड इज प्लस फाइव क्लियर लेट एस टू वन मोर एग्जाम्पल एच टू एस टू ओ थ्री सो यू टेल ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर ऑफ सल्फर एच टू एस टू ओ थ्री ऑप्शन ई फाइव फाइव इज नॉट पॉसिबल फाइव इज इन करेक्ट फोर इज ऑल्सो इन करेक्ट हा रत्ना इट इज करेक्ट वट इज ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर वट यू गेट एयर प्लस टू नाउ एयर टू सल्फर आर प्रेजेंट सो वट वी टेक एयर टू हाइड्रोजन टू इन टू प्लस वन नाउ हाउ मेनी सल्फर आर प्रेजेंट एयर टू सल्फर सो ऑन वन सल्फर इफ चार्ज इज एक्स फॉर टू सल्फर इट इज टू टाइम्स ऑफ एक्स थ्री इन टू माइनस टू इज इक्वल टू जीरो सो वट यू गेट एयर टू एक्स इज इक्वल टू प्लस फोर so what is value of x what we get here plus 2 so what is oxidation number of sulfur in this compound it is plus 2 okay so what we have to find remember in this case that if two sulfur are given we have to write two times of x so x will come out how much it is plus 2 so this is for which molecule neutral molecule now let us take one example or next point for charged species that is polyatomic ion so what we write sum of oxidation number of all atoms in a charged species in charged species is equal to charge present on it so if there is a polyatomic ion then sum of oxidation number of all atoms is equal to charge on that polyatomic ion so if i take example sulfate ion so4 two negative now in sulfate ion how many atoms are present one sulfur is present and how many oxygen are present four and what is total charge on this polyatomic ion it is minus 2 so sum of oxidation number of all these is equal to minus 2 now if we do not know about sulfur but we can take sulfur as x how many oxygen are present 4 into minus 2 so sum of oxidation number is equal to charge present what is charge here minus 2 so what oxidation number we get plus 6 so oxidation number of sulfur in sulfate ion is plus 6 now tell me answer 4 PO4 three negative in phosphate oxidation number of phosphorus oxidation number of phosphorus in phosphate I will write one more and one we have to take Cr2O7 two negative dichromate in chrome these two we have to solve. oxidation number of phosphorus and oxidation number of chromium for phosphorus plus 5 ha correct and solve for dichromate cr2o7 two negative name is dichromate ion this po4 three negative is called as which ion phosphate and this cr2o7 two negative is called as which ion dichromate ion for dichromate no plus 12 is not correct plus 6 uh, plus 5 and plus 6 so how to solve for phosphorus what we take x How many oxygen are present? Four. So four into minus two is equal to minus three. So it is minus eight. So 
सो वट यू गेट प्लस फाइव तो ऑक्सीडेशन नंबर ऑफ फॉस्फोरस इन फॉस्फेट आइन इज हाउ मच प्लस फाइव नो इफ वी टेक डाइक्रोमेट हाउ मेनी आर प्रेजेंट क्रोमियम टू सो वट वी हैव टू टेक टू इन टू एक्स प्लस सेवन इंटू माइनस टू इज इक्वल टू माइनस टू सो वट वी गेट एयर टू एक्स माइनस फोर्टीन इट विल बिकम ट्वेल्व प्लस फोर्टीन माइनस टू सो वट इज वैल्यू ऑफ एक्स प्लस सिक्स so in dichromate ion what is oxidation number of chromium plus 6 why can't we take valency as charge valency is not for any molecule valency is defined for a particular element now this charge is the present on complete cr2o7 not on this chromium you know valency is for elements it is not for any compound so total how many rules we have discussed for calculation for oxidation number total nine rules we have discussed so today you have to revise all these rules you know for these nine in next class we'll discuss a lot of questions on this oxidation number you know so if you remember all these rules then only we can solve these so today we are going to discuss only these rule but in next class what we discuss question based on this can we take valency for single element as charge ha so if it is given for example if o2 negative so now it is ion so in o2 negative oxygen minus 2 so that is its valency as well as charge but valency is not negative valency is only 2 so do not mix valency charge just focus on this oxidation number so today you will get a uh, test for nomenclature Tell for CrO five, make it where you will go very fast. Now be very slow. So first focus on easy topics. I will give you a lot of examples which you have not seen anywhere else also. So today uh, we'll discuss only up to this. Revise these all topics. In next class we'll meet and practice more questions on this. Okay, yesterday I forgot what I have taught you. Can you please tell me which topic you have learned yesterday? See all of you. blue green algae are nitrogen fixing photosynthetic photo autotrophic bacteria so cyanobacteria or blue green algae yeah they are the ones which are going to do the function of nitrogen fixation so as we have completed the first kingdom that is monera i would like to proceed to the second kingdom based on the evolution order you know primitive oldest ones are monerans second group of uh, organisms belong to the kingdom protista so protistan ancestors are monerans so protista totally it is formed from the monerans yeah in the ruminants also sanjana ruminants methanogens are present very good so next group of uh, organisms belong to the second kingdom that is protista so let us see in the protista which organisms are present protista include all unicellular eukaryotes it includes all unicellular eukaryotes okay because the organisms have been separated from the plant kingdom animal kingdom and uh, from the monera kingdom from the plant kingdom all those th organisms have been separated and ernest haeckel created protista as a kingdom third kingdom is a protista which was created by ernest haeckel so he got some of the things like chlorella chlamydomonas from the plant kingdom and he got the amoeba paramecium and euglena from the animal kingdom protozoans he took and he prepared all these organisms by keeping them together he prepared one more kingdom that is called as protista so he created the kingdom protista by taking some of the organisms from the plant kingdom and some of the organisms from the animal kingdom but he took which organisms all should be unicellular they are all having only one cell and they are all eukaryotes okay 
So all unicellular eukaryotes have been separated from the plant kingdom and animal kingdom for the creation of protista. Okay. So this protista include all the eukaryotic features. Eukaryotic features like uh, they have if they have cilia or flagella, they will have 9 plus 2 arrangement, cytoplasmic streaming will be there, histone proteins are present, all eukaryotic well defined nucleus is there, nuclear membrane is there, nucleolus is present, all the eukaryotic features are present in this protistans. But scientists are having so much problems with this protista because they don't, this kingdom does not have any perfect boundaries. They did not limit by any boundary. So, there are no defined, well defined boundaries are not there for this protista kingdom. So, whenever we want to bring some other organism from any other kingdom, we can place it by following some characteristics. So, that is why uh, all the people based on the classification criteria, they used to take out one organism from one kingdom and they used to keep it in this. So, for this kingdom, there are no well defined boundaries, no well defined boundaries. Okay. Because this also shows the mode of nutrition, different types are there. Diverse mode of nutrition is shown by protestants also, like monerans. Okay. So, there are no well defined boundaries for this kingdom. Now, this protista kingdom has been divided into three groups. Protista kingdom, it is divided into three groups photosynthetic protists. So, the photosynthetic protists, they will be performing the photosynthesis. They are meant for photosynthesis. Okay. Then, they have divided them into consumer decomposer protists. Then protozoan protists. Based on the mode of nutrition, okay, the protista kingdom has been divided into three groups of organisms. First group, all of them will perform photosynthesis. So, photosynthetic protists are kept under this. These are called consumer decomposer protists. Here, the heterotrophic mode of nutrition will be there. Okay. Then protozoan protists, they will they will show only the consuming nature of the protistans. So, based on the nutrition, they have classified like this. Under each of this category, we have further types. In the photosynthetic protease, we have three types, chrysophytes. Chrysophytes examples are diatoms, okay, golden algae, they will come under chrysophytes. Second category, okay, I can write here, dinoflagellates. Third category, euglenoids. So, there are three categories under the photosynthetic protists. The first ones are chrysophytes. Under this, the examples of diatoms and golden algae will be there. And second group are dinoflagellates. And third group are euglenoids. Then, in the consumer decomposer protists, we have in this, only one things are there, that is slime molds. In this one, the protozoan protists, we have amoeboid protozoans, amoeboids, flagellates, ciliates, sporozoans. 
this is the classification of protista. So, first protista will be classified like this. I hope all of you can see now. Protista kingdom, it is subdivided into three groups based on the mode of nutrition. Photosynthetic protist, consumer decomposer protist, protozoan protist. Photosynthetic protists are of three types, chrysophytes, dinoflagellates, euglenoids. Under chrysophytes, you will have the examples of diatoms and uh, golden algae, dinoflagellates. That name itself, it is example. Names will be there under dinoflagellates, noctiluca, goniolox, like that. Euglenoids, under this you have best example, euglena. Then consumer decomposer protists, the examples are slime molds. Only one example is there under that, slime molds. They have names. This is a group, group of organisms. So, they will have particular name of the slime molds. Under protozoan protists, you have uh, four types based on the locomotory structures, which helps in their locomotion. So, amoeboids, uh, flagellates, ciliates and sporozoans. We will see all of them in detail. I hope all of you understood this classification. So, once you know this classification, now let us proceed with the first one, the group of organisms, chrysophytes. The first ones. Under that, you are going to learn the diatoms. These are the diatoms. The first group of organisms, chrysophytes. The best example, diatoms under that. I have taken the picture of diatom like this. They will be looking like a soap box. They will have a soap box kind of things, upper plate and lower plate will be there or upper shelf and lower shelf. Two halves will be there, that two halves will be closed like a soap box. You know lower uh, plate or lower half or shelf will be smaller, upper half will be bigger because it should act like a lid. So, it is made up of two halves, okay? that halves will be uh, together like a soap box. So, it looks like a soap box basically. And this is nothing but the cell wall. The cell wall is made up of mainly silica. So, cell wall of diatoms, it is made up of silica. Not only silica, other materials will be there, but main material is silica. So, siliceous cell walls are present in the diatom. And if you open in the center somewhere here, nucleus will be there if you open it nucleus and other cell organelles, membrane bound cell organelles, all of them will be present in this diatoms. Remaining all structures is same. And as they are performing photosynthesis, they have particular pigments also. The particular pigments which are present in these are chlorophylls, okay, xanthophylls, pigments are present. Like xanthophylls, chlorophylls, carotenoids, you will be learning which pigments everything you will be learning after coming here. So, chlorophylls and uh, carotenoids, they are the pigments which are present in them to perform photosynthesis and they will have different kinds of reserve food materials. Okay, And these diatoms, they are present in both fresh water as well as marine water. They are present in both fresh water and marine waters. And these are called as chief producers in the ocean because maximum amount of photosynthesis is done by these ones. Chief producers of oceans or in oceans are the diatoms because maximum photosynthesis, maximum food preparation for the earth is done by the diatoms. And once the diatom is dead, after the death, this Siliceous cell walls, silica containing cell walls will sink to the bottom of the water bodies. Once they sink to the bottom of the water bodies, this silica containing cell walls, they will form the diatomaceous earth, which is also called as Kisselger This is used for various purposes for polishing, for filtration of the syrups. So, it is used as an abrasive material. So, that diatomaceous earth is formed when the diatoms are dead and when this uh, silica containing cell walls are 
or sink, sinking to the bottom of the pond or water bodies, they will form the diatomaceous earth, which is also called Kizilgar. It has so many uses. So, we are making, we are collecting the diatomaceous earth and we are using it for different purposes. And the maximum photosynthesis is done by these. So, they are called as chief producers of oceans. And the body will be looking like a soap box. It will have upper half and lower half. They have the names and all. But it is a normal uh, protist which can perform the photosynthesis. It will take the light with the help of pigments. Pigments will be there, different pigments. And uh, that pigments will be taking light energy and uh, they will perform photosynthesis. They will prepare food. And that food for future use, they will be storing it in the form of preserved food materials also. But the best part about diatoms, they are the chief producers in the ocean. And they will, from them, we are getting diatomaceous earth. Because their cell wall is made up of silica. And other materials also will be there. Have all understood? Yes, ma. Yeah, any, any doubts you have in this? Diatom, it looks like a soap box. Okay, no doubts. Okay, fine. Understood. Very good. So, let us proceed to the next group. After diatoms, we have the dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates. Let us see that. You can see here, this is the dinoflagellate. This also has two halves. But these two are unequal halves. Okay, they are also unequal halves, but you can't find that much difference there. But here you can find the difference. Unequal halves will be there. And these two halves will be connected in the center. Like this one groove will be there. Upper half and lower half. Upper half is generally small, lower half is big. And there is a groove in between the upper half and lower half. That is called as girdle or cingulum, the transverse area, horizontal one, it is called as girdle or cingulum. That is the transverse groove. And here in this groove, you will have two flagella. One flagellum is longitudinal, it will be like this. One flagellum will be transverse flagella. Two flagella are there, that is why they are called dinoflagellates. Dino, di means two, having two flagella. So, two flagella will be one is transverse flagellum, transverse flagellum, another one is longitudinal flagellum. So, as they contain two flagella, these are called as dinoflagellates and both the flagella will be there in the transverse groove. Okay? The transverse groove will be present in this uh, center not exactly central, little bit towards upper side only. So, in that area, you will have one transverse flagellum like this, one longitudinal flagellum will be there. So, they will be showing the rotation movements like this. The upper flagellum will be rotating like this, longitudinal one, transverse one will be rotating sideways. So, it will be showing the whirling like movements, it will be whirling. So, these are also called as whirling whips. because of that flagellar movement. One flagellum will be rotating like this, another flagellum will be sideways rotation. So, they will be showing the whirling movement. So, they are called whirling whips. That is the name, okay, dinoflagellates. Now, if you see here, they have cell wall. This is nothing but what you see the brown one is a cell wall. And this cell wall is made up of very much stiff cellulose plates. It is made up of Stiff cellulose plates. They will be looking like an armor. You know, soldiers will be wearing the armor like that. So, because of this stiff cellulose plates, it will be very tough or rigid on the external side, outside. So, these are also called as armored dinoflagellates because they have extra protection, no? So, these are also called as armored dinoflagellates. Now, in this uh, pic, you can see that it is brown in color. But there are red, yellow, green, different colors are there based on the pigments present in them. 
Here also different pigments are there because they can perform photosynthesis. Carotenoids are present, chlorophylls are present, mainly carotenoids because that brown color, yellow color, red color, okay, green color, blue color, different pigments present in them will give them that color. Okay. And this dinoflagellates are also producers in the ocean because they prefer mostly marine habitats. They are mostly marine. But when you take the photosynthesis of diatoms and dinoflagellates into consideration, diatoms are the primary producers. These ones are called as secondary producers after them. Second ones. The first rank goes to diatoms. Second rank goes to dinoflagellates. So, these are second primary producers after diatoms. Chief producers or primary producers are the diatoms. After diatoms, dinoflagellates will be coming under the primary producers category and in the oceans. They also will perform that photosynthesis and they synthesize their food material and they store that food material in the form of reserve food materials. Reserve food materials also will be different types will be there. They will be storing them. And these ones will multiply so much. Rapid multiplication will happen in the sea, oceans, marine waters. And due to that, wherever they are multiplying so much, it will cause the red tides. They will be having the pigments, no? And their rapid multiplication will give color. They up, That water will appear colored. So, these are the ones which causes the red tides. Red tides are caused by these because of the rapid multiplication. And when they are multiplying in that water, they will be releasing different kinds of toxins like neurotoxins will be released. Okay, so Different kinds of toxins will be released by the dinoflagellates into the water bodies. If any aquatic organism or any organism, if it drinks that water, so, they will be getting that uh, toxins entering into their body and it might kill that organisms. They are that much dangerous. Sac C toxin, digitoxin, different types of neurotoxins will be there. They will be released into the water bodies. So, they are dangerous. We can't drink the water with the toxin which is released by the dinoflagellate. Even for the cattle, it is dangerous. So, dinoflagellates, though they are the primary producers, though second in number, they are good because they are synthesizing the food by photosynthesis. But we can make use of that food for other purposes. But the rapid multiplication is causing the red tides where the toxins will be released. That is dangerous for the living organisms in the water bodies. Okay. Have all understood dinoflagellates? The next one, euglenoids. If you want, yeah, you can write that. Examples here. Goniolox, gymnodinium. Gymnodinium, these are the examples. Okay, one more Noctiluca. He told that uh, bioluminescence showing dinoflagellate is uh, Noctiluca, bioluminescence, it emits light. Okay, that is bioluminescence. For that example, is Noctiluca. You will be learning after coming here other details. This much is enough. So, diatoms are over, dinoflagellates are over, the third category, okay, euglenoids, okay. Let us see the euglenoids, under that you have only one example, that is euglena. Euglena, this is the euglena one, which is having the flagella. You can see here, two flagella will be coming. But one flagellum is stopped here only and one flagellum only will be coming out. So, it will be having one short flagellum and one longer flagellum. But that shorter flagellum will be stopped here only and longer flagellum will be coming out with the filament outside. Then this uh, organism will be having the nucleus. This is the nucleus and nucleolus is there. And to the nucleus you can see mitochondria, all eukaryotic features are there. Uh, ER, Golgi, okay, contractile vacuole here near to this uh, reservoir. This part is called as reservoir. Okay, uh, this is called as uh, cytopharynx. It is equal to mouth pharynx, and this is the reservoir. 
So, in the reservoir next into the cytoplasm, contractor vacuole is present, surrounded by the axillary vacuoles. And this is Golgi, this is ER, and these are the chloroplasts, these are the main ones. And you can see here, stigma or eye spot will be there next to this photoreceptor. This is the stigma or eye spot, paraflagellar body. These are the parts of euglena. Okay. The main part with this chloroplast, it can perform photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. And this contractile vacuole is meant for osmoregulation. This stigma eye spot, stigma or eye spot or photoreceptor, these are going to receive the sunlight. They are going to identify the light source and they will be moving towards the light. So, if light is available, the euglena will be performing photosynthesis and it will be acting like a plant. If light is not available, then it will act like a heterotroph animal and it will be ingesting the animals through this which will be taken inside. So, it can show both the modes of nutrition like plant or like the animal. So, it is showing the mixotrophic mode of nutrition. If light is available, then it will be showing the photosynthesis. If light is not there, it will be showing the heterotrophism. So, based on that light source, it can be a phototroph or a heterotroph. So, this will show mixotrophic nutrition. Mixotrophic nutrition. Okay, when light source is there, that light will be recognized by the stigma eye spot photoreceptor and it will move towards the light source to perform photosynthesis. If it is not there, it will be ingesting holozoic mode of nutrition. It will take away the smaller ones, protozoans and all inside through this uh, cytopharynx reservoir, okay, cytostom like that and it will be finally sent to the cytoplasm. Here, it will be forming a food vacuum. And in the food vacuole, the digestion of that uh, whatever the protozoan food material is there, it will be done. And the digested materials will be absorbed into the cytoplasm because cytoplasmic streaming will be going on. And this uh, ER and nucleus will be there and contractile vacuole will do the function of osmoregulation because these are generally present in stagnant fresh waters. Stagnant water also they can be there. Fresh waters also they can be there. But they will never be present in the sea water, ocean water, marine waters. They generally stay in the fresh waters like ponds, lakes, etc. Whereas dinoflagellates, they are mostly marine. Diatoms, they are uh, present in fresh water as well as sea water, both. Dinoflagellates, mostly marine. Euglenoids, they are fresh water organisms. These are similar to plants. Because they contain the same pigment like plant that is chlorophyll A. Particularly chlorophyll A is present in euglena which is similar to the plant pigment. In the plant also chlorophyll A pigment is there. In the euglena also chlorophyll A is there. So, in terms of pigments, euglena and plants are same. And they both will perform the photosynthesis same way. Okay, with the help of light. Photoautotrophism will be shown. But this is uh, called as biological puzzle because if light is there, it is behaving like a plant. If light is not there, it is behaving like an animal. So, this is actually called as biological puzzle. Biological puzzle. It was a wonder for the scientists first how it is able to do biological puzzle. Okay. This is about euglenoids. Euglena is the best example. Euglena. I hope all of you understood. So, we have completed the photosynthetic protein. We have completed the photosynthetic protein. Yes. First one diatoms, second one's dinoflagellates, third one's euglenoids. Okay, they have different pigments, but all of them will perform photosynthesis and they will be preparing the food. Yes. Very good, very good. One last point. In diatoms, you know, the cell wall is made up of silica. 
in dinoflagellates cellulosic plates are there stiff cellulose plates are there in euglenoids there is no cell wall no cell wall this external layer is called as pellicle it is uh, made up of protein protein rich layer cell wall is absent in euglenoids they contain a protein rich layer called as pellicle pellicle is present in there okay army by goniolox uh, goniolox is the dinoflagellate ma okay so diatoms they are made up of silica in their cell walls dinoflagellates they have cellulose in their cell walls cellulose plates Euglena, no cell wall, but pellicle is present, which is a protein rich layer. It is made up of proteins. Okay. What is that? Golden algae. Yeah, golden algae, their uh, name is desmides. That is also, they also look like diatoms only. In your uh, textbook, they have given only diatoms. Golden algae, example name is enough. Okay. Yeah, any further doubts ma? Have all understood? Silica contains carbohydrates. Silica is that crystals will be there in the sand and all. Silica is a chemical. Yeah, yes, Sikshana. Anju. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, shall I ask questions now? No doubts. Very good. Slime molds. Yeah, we will proceed to that. We will proceed. Okay, time is, uh, yeah. Time is not there. So, I will ask the questions tomorrow. I hope all of you understood photosynthetic protein. Okay, let us go to the next one. I will ask at the end. Slime molds. This is how the slime molds body will be looking. This is slime mold. Okay, these are the ones which are uh, decomposer protists, particularly decomposer and consumer protists. So, they are the particularly the saprophytes, saprophytic protists because they will be feeding on the dead and decaying organic matter. So, whatever uh, organic matter that is present on their way, they will be eating them, twigs, organic matter, they will be feeding on them and they will be moving. Okay. And during the favorable conditions, they will form this structure which is called as plasmodium. This structure is called as plasmodium. This is the body of the slime molds. It is the body of slime molds. So, body of slime molds is called as plasmodium. So, during favorable conditions, when it is feeding on the twigs, the fallen leaves, organic matter, this plasmodium will be formed and it will be growing to several feet. It can become so much big, okay, by consuming all the organic matter, whatever comes on its way. So, this slime mold body plasmodium, okay, it will be growing in the favorable conditions and during unfavorable conditions, it forms the fruiting bodies. They form fruiting bodies. And in that fruiting body, spores are formed. And spores will be dispersed by air. Air currents will be dispersing the spores. Okay. And these are all nuclei. You can see here, these are all nuclei, multinucleate condition. So, plasmodium is having multinucleate condition many nuclei will be there, multinucleate condition. So, this slime molds just they will be looking like this. The body is called as plasmodium and it will be spreading by feeding on the organic matter and twigs. So, it is saprophytic in nature and during unfavorable conditions, this plasmodium will give rise to the fruiting bodies like this and in that spores will be formed like this. This is the fruiting body and the spores will come out. And this spore will germinate during the favorable condition. 
this is the slime molds the body of the slime mold is plasmodia i hope all of you understood okay the last one protozoans protozoans these may be there in the fresh water or marine waters they can be predators or parasites and they show generally heterotrophic mode of nutrition there is no autotroph in this all are heterotroph and in this the first example amoeboid protozoan in the classification i have given you amoeboid protozoans amoeba it has the locomotory structures that are pseudopodia pseudopodia so they don't have any true legs like that but false feet are there pseudopodia these are called false feet okay so they'll move from one place to another place with the help of pseudopodia amoeba you know irregular in shape and it has one contractile vacuum okay meant for osmoregulation then you have uh, some of the amoeboids may have silica in their cell walls marine forms will have that again one more example is there entamoeba amoeba entamoeba these all will come under amoeboids and after this you have the paramecium paramecium will have cilia the locomotory structures in this are cilia so it is coming under ciliated protozoans so because they will be moving uh, from one area to another area with the help of cilia so ciliated protozoans these are also there in the fresh waters generally then this is also called as slipper animal cule because of its shape okay this also has the contractile vacuoles see the number of contractile vacuoles here posterior contractile vacuole this one and anterior contractile vacuole is this one two contractile vacuoles are present then this is the structure of plasmodium this is a sporozoan in this there are no locomotory structures no locomotory structures because they don't move with any locomotory structures okay they don't have so they won't move and this plasmodium is the causative agent of malaria it is a pathogen which causes the malaria so it is called as malarian parasite malarian parasite the structure of plasmodium will be looking like this body of the slime molds is a plasmodium that is the name of the body but here this is the malarian parasite malarian parasite okay it is causing the malaria and it does not have any locomotory structures then you have the last one the flagellated protozoans which are having flagella for their locomotion flagella they contain for locomotion and example for this is trypanosoma trypanosoma amoeboid protozoans amoeba is example <coughs> entamoeba then ciliated protozoans paramecium because they move with the help of cilia then uh, flagellated protozoans example is trypanosoma then there are no locomotory structures in the sporozoans but that sporozoan example is plasmodium okay and it is the malarian parasite i hope all of you understood so all of you read and come protista tomorrow we'll proceed to the next topic thank you ma see you tomorrow hello 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 everyone how are you all and let us start today's class without any further delay okay in today's class we are going to talk about the chapter breathing and exchange of gases so yes everyone i think this chapter has been done just like i have uh, done the animal tissues i have discussed animal tissues previously with you 
just like that i think breathing and exchange of gases is also you know taught a little bit yes yes everyone malika arjun uh, i mean shravni yes <laughs> thank you yes all of you are excited so yes tell me quickly what have you uh, already understood in this chapter breathing and exchange of gases yes in the comments tell me quickly yes tell me quickly in the comments don't talk to each other talk to me okay don't talk to each other so we are going to understand about the chapter breathing and exchange of gases breathing and exchange of gases this is the name of the chapter breathing and exchange of gases yes what you have studied already in this chapter okay you have studied inspiration expiration okay all of you you have studied inspiration and expiration yes you have also studied alveolar exchange of gases okay okay so we will see what we can discuss today from this chapter okay we will see what we can discuss so first of all i will give you a brief introduction about the chapter what all things are there which you have to deal with what all things are there which you have to study in this chapter let me tell you first of all that okay everyone okay everyone sindhu it's okay beta so now all of you are into the class just focus on the class beta okay don't waste your time in chatting with each other just stay focused and listen to the class because each and every minute of yours is important okay okay yes everyone okay so in this chapter beta first of all let me tell you what is the meaning of the name of the chapter okay so there is a process in our body that process is known as respiration yes what is that important process that important process is respiration okay by this process only by the process of respiration only we are getting energy so beta beta we are getting energy okay see two things we require for the respiration we require food and we require air yes or no air and food are very very important na for our survival we cannot live without food we cannot live without air and also water yes or no water is also required but if we see only food then from the food mainly we are getting glucose okay what is glucose glucose is c6 h12 o6 and from the air this we are getting from the food and from the air from the air we are getting oxygen okay so in presence of oxygen this glucose will break beta break down of glucose in presence of oxygen this is cellular respiration what it will yield what it will form when this glucose will break down in in presence of oxygen this will lead to the formation of carbon dioxide water and lots of energy energy for this energy only this respiration is taking place okay for this energy you will study the cellular respiration in botany in detail okay cellular respiration here i will talk about this whole process this whole process is occurring in five steps beta this res respiration this whole process this whole process is a five step process it is a five step process respiration respiration is a is a five step process beta so yes everyone can you tell me the first step can you tell me the first step of this process can you tell me the first step of this process yes everyone tell me in the comments tell me tell me tell, tell me be active in the chat section tell me in the comments the first process is pulmonary ventilation first process is breathing yes absolutely correct the first process is beta breathing this breathing is also known as the breathing is also known as beta pulmonary ventilation pulmonary ventilation so in this breathing or in this pulmonary ventilation two process are occurring two process are occurring one is inspiration another is expiration yes inspiration can also be called as inhalation 
Inspiration can also be called as inhalation and expiration. There is a separate mechanism how inspiration takes place and how expiration takes place. I think you have studied the mechanism of inspiration and expiration previously. Yes or no? Have you studied the mechanism of inspiration and expiration previously? So, in inspiration, we will take the air inside and in expiration, we will throw the air outside. When beta, we are taking the air inside, in this air, there is a very important gas that is oxygen, right? So, we want to take that oxygen, okay? So, how that oxygen from the alveoli go into the blood and how from the blood the CO2 will come out in the alveoli, that is known as exchange of gases. So, what is the second step? Everyone, tell me in the chats quickly. What is the second step? Second step. What is the second step? Exchange of gases. At which level? This exchange of gases is occurring at which level, beta? In between what and what? Exchange of gases between alveoli and blood because in the alveoli, alveoli is the part of the lungs, you have a respiratory passage. For the respiration, you require respiratory passage. Have you uh, studied about the respiratory passage everyone? This respiration, this whole process, this respiration, this whole process is carried out by the respiratory passage. There is a respiratory passage. If you know respiratory passage, I will tell you briefly. In this respiratory passage, it starts from your external nostrils. We have above the lips, above the upper lip, we have these two nostrils. Okay, These are external nostrils or known as external nares. From here, our respiratory passage will start. It will go to the nasal cavity, then it will go to the nasopharynx. Okay, then larynx will come here, voice box larynx from which I am speaking. Yes, I, I am uh, audible to you all. Okay, I am producing sound. So, that is sound or voice box. Okay, so then uh, that larynx will then further lead to the trachea and that trachea will divide into two parts and it will enter into the lungs. So, we have two lungs. Okay, we have two lungs. So, the trachea will divide and it will form bronchi. Further, it will form the secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, bronchioles. Okay. So, trachea, primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, then bronchioles and then alveoli will come into the lungs. Whole this passage is respiratory passage. In this respiratory passage, two parts are there, beta. Two parts. Two parts are there. One is the conducting part. One is the conducting part, conducting part and another is the respiratory or exchange part. Another is the respiratory or exchange part. So, this respiratory or exchange part is alveoli beta, alveoli. Before that, everything is the conducting part. Okay. So, conducting part starts from, it starts from external nostrils. It starts from external nostrils till terminal bronchioles, till terminal bronchioles. Whereas, in the exchange part, there are respiratory bronchioles. Respiratory bronchioles will come after terminal bronchioles. Respiratory bronchioles till alveoli till alveoli beta, till alveoli, okay, till alveoli. So, this is our respiratory passage. The process respiration occurs in the five steps. First step is breathing. Breathing simply means in inspiration and expiration. Inspiration and expiration. I was telling you the second step that is exchange of gases. So, first of all, the exchange of gases will occur in the alveoli beta, inside the lungs alveoli and do you know around the alveoli so much of blood vessels are there, okay. So, in those blood vessels what is there, what is flowing, blood is flowing, okay. So, this exchange of gases will occur between alveoli and blood, 
okay alveoli and blood we can say at alveolar level the exchange of gases is taking place now in the blood oxygen has come into the blood okay now this oxygen needs to reach to every tissue needs to reach to every tissue so the third step will be yes everyone can you tell me in the comment can you tell me in the chat section what will be the third step the oxygen should go to the tissues so we will call transport of gases yes everyone transport of gases transport of gases in this transport of gases in this transport of gases you know that oxygen is going from alveoli it is going to the blood and from blood it is going to the tissues beta it is going to the tissues this is oxygen 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 is going from alveoli to blood from blood to tissues but if you see carbon dioxide carbon dioxide is coming from tissues to blood and then from blood to alveoli so this is transport of gases beta transport of gases all right are you understanding the meaning of transport of gases and the medium of transport is beta blood the medium of transport is blood the medium of transport is blood blood is the medium of transport through the blood only the oxygen will travel through the blood only the carbon dioxide will travel both of the gases will travel through the blood i will tell you in which forms they will travel okay okay now coming so now tissues got the oxygen tissues are very happy tissues have got the oxygen okay so here again when tissues will get the oxygen from the blood to tissues exchange of gases will occur na so what can be the fourth step everyone fourth step fourth step is again exchange of gases again exchange of gases between blood and tissues between blood and tissues okay between blood and tissues and now the tissues will get the oxygen so what will be the fifth step fifth step will be cellular respiration cellular respiration means utilization of utilization of oxygen for the breakdown of glucose for the breakdown of glucose to get energy so are you people understanding the five steps everyone if you are not understanding any of the step please tell me in the comments yes everyone so the first step is breathing also known as pulmonary ventilation okay also known as pulmonary ventilation inspiration expiration second step when oxygen will go into the alveoli that oxygen needs to be exchanged and it needs to go into the blood so now oxygen has reached into the blood then this blood will transport this oxygen to the tissues so when this blood will reach to the tissues again exchange of gases will occur between the blood and tissues and then the tissues will get the oxygen and then the tissues will utilize the oxygen this is going to be the five step yes ratna third and fourth what is the difference between third and fourth beta transport see see everyone exchange means i will tell you wait let me go to the next see this is alveoli beta and let us suppose this is blood this is blood okay this is your blood and this is alveoli this is alveoli so exchange means the oxygen and carbon dioxide is getting exchanged on the basis of the partial pressure okay if oxygen partial pressure is more in alveoli and less in blood oxygen will come into the blood okay see here here in alveoli partial pressure of oxygen is beta 104 
this blood which is coming here na this is beta deoxygenated blood in this blood oxygen is not there so this deoxygenated blood partial pressure of oxygen is 40 partial pressure of oxygen is 40 so oxygen is going to come from alveoli to blood oxygen is coming this is diffusion or exchange of gases oxygen is coming now if you see carbon dioxide this is deoxygenated blood beta carbon dioxide is more partial pressure of carbon dioxide in this blood is more it is 45 whereas in alveoli partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 40 okay so where it is more here it is more and where it is less here it is less so that is why carbon dioxide is going from blood to alveoli beta this is exchange this is exchange and this exchange of gases is occurring at alveolar level are you understanding everyone are you understanding this exchange at alveolar level now i can tell you exchange at tissue level fourth step fourth step okay fourth step so now let me tell you the fourth step let us suppose this is the blood this is beta blood which blood is coming near to the tissues near to the tissues it is oxygenated blood and let us suppose these are the tissues beta these are tissues okay in the tissues carbon dioxide will be more partial pressure of co2 is more beta 45 okay and partial pressure of oxygen is less partial pressure of oxygen is less okay in the oxygenated blood partial pressure of oxygen is more 95 whereas partial pressure of carbon dioxide partial pressure of carbon dioxide is less 40 okay and what is the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues 40 so you can see first of all oxygen oxygen is more in the blood oxygen is more in the blood oxygenated blood 95 mm of hg oxygen in the tissues how much oxygen 40 where it is more blood where it is less tissues so oxygen will exchange from blood to tissues oxygen will come are you understanding next co2 where co2 is more tissues where co2 is less oxygenated blood so co2 will diffuse co2 will diffuse from tissues to blood co2 this is exchange ratna are you understanding the exchange now i will tell you the transport in which form the oxygen and carbon dioxide will be transported oxygen is transported from here to here and co2 is transported from here to here okay so that will be transport beta exchange is simply between the two things on the basis of difference in partial pressure okay on the basis of difference in partial pressure all these partial pressures you have to remember in the ncrt there is a very nice figure in which all the partial pressures are mentioned and it is very easy to remember the partial pressure once you will come here i will tell you the trick very easy trick to remember the partial pressure okay so now everyone you understood the exchange now here this is the exchange between alveoli and blood here is the exchange between blood and tissues now let me tell you the transport let me clear you the meaning of transport of gases okay okay come here transport of gases beta transport of gases so we have two gases one is oxygen one is carbon dioxide both the gases will be transported by blood blood is the only medium in the body for the transport 
uh, ammu beta what is diffusion beta diffusion is also exchange of gases exchange of gases is occurring by simple diffusion diffusion means whenever something is going along the concentration gradient when something is going from high concentration to low concentration okay so when a gas is moving from high partial pressure to low partial pressure it is diffusion beta it is diffusion now everyone now everyone coming to transport of gases what is the medium of transport beta blood blood okay i have told you i remember i taught you blood yes everyone do you remember blood do you remember blood yes everyone tell me do you remember blood what are the components of blood blood has plasma blood has formed elements formed elements are rbc wbc platelets do you remember yes everyone so in which cells there is hemoglobin rbc in which cells there is hemoglobin rbc so rbc and plasma these two will help the plasma will help and the rbc will help in the transport of gases in this transport of gases wbcs will not help platelets will not help okay wbcs will not help platelets will not help only two things will help one is plasma and another is rbc okay everyone now blood let me tell you the transport of oxygen uh, or and transport of carbon dioxide both i will tell you transport of carbon dioxide first transport of carbon dioxide occurs in occurs in three forms beta three forms whereas whereas transport of oxygen transport of oxygen occurs in two forms in two forms okay what are these two forms and what are these three forms what are these three forms first is this co2 and this oxygen gases can get dissolved and what is the fluid part of the blood plasma so these oxygen and carbon dioxide can get dissolved in the plasma okay so the first form is dissolved form beta dissolved form dissolved form how much percentage of co2 travels in the dissolved form 7% 7% this dissolved form travels through plasma beta 7% co2 travels 7% co2 travels in the dissolved form and this travels through plasma through plasma now next is next is bicarbonate ion form bicarbonate ion form what is a bicarbonate ion bicarbonate ion is hco3 negative in this ion form 70% 70% of the co2 travels in this form beta 70% of the co2 travels in the form of bicarbonate ion now can you tell me ions are present in which part of blood plasma yes ions are present in which part of blood plasma so this bicarbonate ion form also travels through plasma it travels through plasma beta through plasma through plasma so total how much percentage travels through plasma total how much percentage travels through plasma yes tell me total how much percentage travels through plasma can we tell 77% 77% co2 travels through plasma travels through plasma yes or no everyone 
how much is left 23 percent is left so 23 percent 23 percent is left okay that will go into the rbc in form of carb amino hemoglobin carb amino hemoglobin form carb amino hemoglobin form how much percentage left 23 percent okay 23 percent hbco2 you can write hbco2 is carb amino hemoglobin form how much percentage 23 percent okay hemoglobin is present inside the rbc so it will not go through the plasma it will go through the rbc is 23 percent through rbc through rbc so everyone co2 is getting transported by blood from one place to another place transport simply means from one place to another place when you will be coming from your hometown to this campus Sri Chaitanya Goshala, how you will be coming? Some people will be coming by public transport, some people will be coming by bus, some people will be coming by train, some people will be coming by their own vehicle like their car, okay? Some people will be, maybe some of you are nearby only, so they will come by bike or uh, uh, scooty. Everyone has different, different mode of transport, na beta? But in our blood, there is only one mode of transport, that is blood. And in blood, only two things are there. One is plasma and one is RBC. One is plasma and one is RBC. So, through plasma, how much CO2 will travel? 77%. 7% in dissolved form. Simply, it is dissolved. 70% in bicarbonate ion form. I will teach you when I will get, uh, you know, further class. So, I will teach you that how this bicarbonate ion is getting formed in detail okay but first of all you should understand this and then how much percentage through the rbc inside the blood only rbc is there na 23 percent co2 will go inside the rbc it will tell no i don't like plasma i want hemoglobin i want to sit with hemoglobin so this 23 percent co2 will sit with hemoglobin okay and then it will form the carb amino hemoglobin so are you understanding this three forms are you understanding all these three forms everyone please give me a thumbs up if you are understanding these three forms now i will tell you very easy two forms of oxygen oxygen will travel only in two forms okay only in two forms one is the dissolved form beta one is the dissolved form and one is the one is the oxyhemoglobin form oxyhemoglobin form oxyhemoglobin form dissolved form oxyhemoglobin form oxyhemoglobin form how much percentage dissolved form 3% 3% oxygen in dissolved form rest 97% oxygen with hemoglobin it will tell no 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 i to like only hemoglobin okay i will not convert into any ion i will like hemoglobin i will go with hemoglobin so so 97 percent oxygen goes through the rbc with the hemoglobin so this is through rbc this is through rbc and this is through plasma this is through plasma dissolved in the plasma dissolved in the plasma so are you understanding yes everyone are you understanding this are you understanding that three forms of co2 and two forms of o2 yes everyone so now you understood now you understood the meaning of breathing inspiration expiration exchange of gases between alveoli and blood Transport of gases, transport of oxygen, transport of carbon dioxide in how many forms, what is the percentage and exchange of gases between blood and tissues, 
and then cellular respiration ultimately the last step is cellular respiration yes everyone tell me have you understood the glimpse of the chapter have you understood what all we are going to study in this chapter obviously beta i cannot teach you the complete chapter in detail in 45 minutes hai na i hope you are understanding this but at least i am trying to make things easier for you when you will come to the campus when we will teach you this chapter it will take almost one week okay at least four five classes are required okay but when you will listen to those classes na you will understand them very easily why because now i have made easy i have made this chapter easy for you now you have understood the meaning of breathing meaning of respiration meaning of inspiration expiration meaning of exchange what is the difference between exchange at alveolar site and what is the difference between exchange at tissue site and now you understood what is the meaning of transport okay so i hope you understood all these five steps the meaning of all these five steps this is the essence of the chapter this is the overview of the chapter if you have understood these terms the meaning of these terms okay then you will understand the topic very easily under the topic breathing you will understand the mechanism you will understand the uh, respiratory volumes capacity how much air we are taking in how much air we are throwing out what is the capacity how much total we can take in total we can throw out all these things you will understand then you will understand exchange at two levels depends upon the partial pressure depends upon the solubility and depends upon the thickness of diffusion membrane i have told you diffusion membrane yes in the animal tissues do you remember diffusion membrane in the animal tissues yes everyone tell me okay now quickly i will ask you one question quickly i will ask you one question i have told you here transport of gases okay so so can you tell me total how much percentage of co2 is getting transported by rbc yes without looking at the board you have to tell so without looking at the board you have to tell how much percentage of co2 traveling through rbc 23% okay how much oxygen how much oxygen traveling through rbc how much total oxygen traveling through rbc 97% okay now i will ask you how much oxygen traveling in dissolved form in dissolved form how much oxygen in dissolved form 3% how much oxygen in dissolved form 3% how much co2 in dissolved form how much co2 in dissolved form how much co2 in dissolved form 7% why 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 this is the question why 7% why 7% co2 in dissolved form and why 3% o2 in dissolved form why 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 more co2 is getting dissolved in the plasma than oxygen sampath i know because i i want to you know boost up the confidence of my students why tell me why you told me 7% co2 and 3% o2 in dissolved form why that is my question so i will tell you the answer because because co2 is 20 to 25 times more soluble 
more soluble than oxygen than oxygen solubility of co2 is more this is because of the solubility solubility of co2 is more than the solubility of oxygen okay solubility of co2 is more than the solubility of oxygen that is why co2 is going 7% in dissolved form and o2 is going only 3% in dissolved form are you understanding okay so that was my time and that was all about my class and i hope you all have understood all these basic things and i hope you have enjoyed my class okay so just uh, don't forget to hit the like button okay subscribe to the channel hit the like button hit all like all the videos okay uh, which you are seeing and getting the benefit now you should like those videos okay that is the all motivation you can give to us and thank you so much for, okay then bye bye take care god bless you all